Hello, folks that are just, people are just logging in here. We're going to get started in just a minute for our battle against Buckthorn and its buddies. Oh, Graham, and that reminded me to silence my phone right there. <laughs> All right. Well, as folks are trickling in here, um, my name is Sarah McHale. I am the Community Engagement Specialist with the Land Conservancy of McHenry County. Um, and today we're just going to be talking about some common invasive shrubs um, and some native, some control ideas and some native plant replacement ideas. Um, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box. I'll look at that at the end and go through that. I'm also going to give you my email address so you could just email me if you have any questions. And the recording for this program is going to be sent to you um, probably today or tomorrow at some point. All right, let's get started. All right, who are we? The Land Conservancy of McHenry County. We are in northeastern Illinois, about an hour northwest of Chicago. We are a nonprofit land trust who's been around since 1991. Um, what land trusts do, because there's land trusts all across the country. Um, we like to preserve and take care of land, but also work with the private landowners who want to do the same thing. Um, so that could be uh, private residents, that could be municipalities, it could be libraries, schools, churches, there's all different landowners. Um, basically, we want to support you in achieving your environmental goals. We do that in a whole variety of ways. We do education programs like this, conservation easements, we do a native plant tree and shrub sale every spring and fall. More info can be found by following us on social media or looking on our website. Um, we restore and take care of land as well that we own. Um, so there's just all different ways that we do to work with landowners, farmers, all different kinds of things. Um, find your local land trust at findalandtrust.org and figure out how you can get connected and involved with them. All right, so let's start off with some definitions that you have probably heard commonly used. Um, the differences between a non-native and a native plant versus an invasive plant. What do all of these terms kind of mean? Um, first, let's start with a native plant. A native plant is a plant that has grown in a certain region for thousands of years with no human intervention. So that means that um, in our area where I am here in Northern Illinois, we had glaciers recede starting about 10,000 years ago. And in that time, there are communities of plants that have developed and um, it's generally not because of people planting them. And so a non-native plant is a plant that has been introduced into a certain area um, from a different region of the globe. Um, an example being a lilac tree or shrub. Um, an invasive plant, tree or shrub. So the term invasive technically should only be used in when you're speaking about a non-native plant. Now, so invasive plants, what they do is when they are introduced into a certain region, and it normally takes time for this to happen. So it could take decades for this to happen, but they grow out of control. Their populations um, expand so much that they end up creating monocultures and displace the native vegetation that used to grow there. Um, I often hear people use the term invasive and apply it to some particularly aggressive native plants. And technically, you're not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to use the word invasive for a native plant. Whatever. It doesn't totally matter for most of us. <laughs> okay. 
why are some of these uh, non-native invasive trees, shrubs, and plants here? Where'd they come from? Um, most of them were introduced through the landscape industry. So we bought them and put them in our yards or hired landscapers who did that. And they've escaped from cultivation. Buckthorn is a per perfect example of that. Um, or agriculture is another way. So sweet clover is an example. So plants that were introduced for livestock feed, okay, or honey production in the case of sweet clover. Um, why do we care about these non-native invasive plants? Why do we care about them being here? Basically our native uh, flora can't compete. So these native plants, um, are introduced from different regions of the globe uh, that maybe have a different climate. Um, maybe it gets warmer earlier where they're from. And so they leaf out a lot earlier and they hang on to their leaves a lot later. Um, that shades out our native plants real early in the spring. Um, maybe they uh, just create they take up space, okay? They take up too much space. They're using nutrients. Um, they don't necessarily have a lot of insects that are eating them because they haven't lived here for thousands of years. So there aren't all kinds of insects that are able to eat their leaves like there are with our native trees, shrubs, and plants. Um, so we lose plant diversity when those monocultures are formed. And then when you lose plant diversity, you by extension lose wildlife diversity as well. And there, this is, this is so far reaching, I'm just gonna touch on it, but um, plants like buckthorn actually give off a chemical that can affect the tadpole and larva development of salamanders and frogs. And so it messes up the tadpole or it messes up the larva of the salamanders um, when the chemical leaches into the springtime ponds that develop in some of our woods. Um, honeysuckle has a red berry that is actually changing the tail feather colors of some of our birds, like these cedar waxwings, who normally have a yellow tipped tail. And researchers have found that cedar waxwings who are eating an abundance of honeysuckle berries are actually developing red uh, tail feathers. Who knows what the implications are for that as um, it applies to courtship displays and all kinds of things. Um, there are some of our native birds who will nest obviously in like non-native trees and shrubs because there's so many of them. And in that picture there in the lower right with the weird looking raccoon, um, there's a little nest there and they're nesting lower in things like honeysuckle than they normally would because the branches are pretty stout. Um, so they're nesting lower and they're just experiencing a higher level of predation than they would if they were nesting in our native trees and shrubs where they're nesting a little bit higher and the branches aren't quite as sturdy and they're not as easily climbed by things like raccoons. Um, as opposed to, okay, so these non-native trees and shrubs, they're also creating tons of shade, which is then preventing our uh, oak trees from being able to grow. So acorns, they need light to be able to germinate and grow. And because of that loss of oak regeneration, we're seeing a loss of pollinators. Oaks support over 500 different kinds of moths and butterflies. That means that all these little things you see on the screen here, their caterpillars eat the leaves of oak trees, all right? They're not eating the leaves of buckthorn <laughs> and honeysuckle. And it's the caterpillars that are this vital stage of the whole kind of pollinator life cycle. Um, obviously, 
caterpillars turn into the butterflies and the moths. Caterpillars are also a really good source of food for birds to feed to their babies, um, full of protein and fat. And that's what those baby birds need. All right, so how do we get rid of these invasive trees and shrubs? And now, believe me, I know how overwhelming this can be, especially when you own acres and acres of land. Um, and I always tell people, you know what, you just need to start. I don't care if it's 10 feet by 10 feet, you just need to start. You need to do it in a way that works for you and your schedule and your time, budget, physical ability. And you just kind of turn blinders onto the rest of it. And you just start chipping away at it a little bit at a time. And the first way, the first thing you need to do is learn how to identify some of these things. And we're gonna go through some today, but you're gonna need more than just this one webinar to really learn how to do it. Um, there's some great book resources out there. I really like this one, Invasive Plants of the Upper Midwest. Um, there's some great free apps that you can download like one called iNaturalist is a really great free app that we use a lot. Um, so your first step is going to be learning how to ID things. And your second step is going to be removal, clearing out that brush basically. Then this third step is so vital, you need to replace what you just took out with native plants, trees, and shrubs, all right? And that could be with live plugs. It could be with seed. There's all different ways to do it. And then you repeat that process <laughs> year after year after year. And eventually you get to a point, if you keep up with whatever area you worked on, if you keep up with it and you keep removing the invasives, eventually you get to a point where it's a little bit more stable and it requires much less work. All right, so let's get into some ID of some of our very most common invasives that I see here in this region. So part of my job is going out and doing site visits for homeowners. And it could be people in a residential neighborhood or it could be people that live on hundred acres, doesn't matter. Um, and I help them come up with a plan and do surveys, like botanical surveys of their sites to figure out what do they have growing there. And I teach them how to ID stuff. And so the, here's some things that I commonly see when I do site visits for folks. Honeysuckle. <laughs> this is one of our most common. Um, one of the first plants to leaf out in the spring. Remember what I told you about sometimes they come from a more warmer climate. Uh, Japanese honeysuckle is going to have a variety of colors of flowers, as you can see up there in the left. You're normally going to see those in like late spring, early summer. They could be white, pink, kind of all different colors, but they're paired. All right. And you could see that with the berries um, down there in the bottom left as well. Paired berries, opposite, uh, opposite leaves. And right now at this time of the year, you're going to see opposite buds as well. So the buds are going to be just opposite of each other on the stems. Um, the stems on some of the larger ones are going to be hollow, as you could see there. And what I look for what the dead giveaway is with honeysuckle is this gray or tan, um, vertically striped, usually multi-trunked arching growth habit. All right, that's pretty much the dead giveaway. Those vertical stripes and that grayish tan color. And you see, and that is an ID characteristic that you can use throughout the year when there's no leaves even. Buckthorn, so European buckthorn, um, scientific name being Ramnus cathartica. Cathartica, let's think about what that means. So, uh, Catharsis, when a bird eats those berries, uh, it runs right through them, okay, and it actually depletes their nutrition and can lead to dehydration as well. So it's really actually very harmful for 
or bird population and wildlife in general, not just birds. Here's a buckthorn hedge that's being um, pruned and managed <laughs> in this backyard habitat. Like I see that all the time that people are like paying landscaping companies to prune into these shapes, things like buckthorn. How do we know that we have buckthorn? Um, so if you look at the upper left there, the bark, would you scrape through the older, the older real rough buckthorn um, trunks? You're gonna see this like yellow layer when you kind of scrape through the bark. That's, that's one dead giveaway. Um, down on the left there, the bottom left, that's the, that's the ID characteristic that I use year round is this terminal bud with the thorns. So terminal bud, that's just the last bud on the stem. So if you're sitting there looking at a twig, look for the bud at the very end of the twig. And that bud, and you might have to look at a few because sometimes they break off, but those buds, you see how they're kind of like, there's two buds, they're opposite of each other and they're curved around that straight up thorn. So there's where the thorn term comes from. But then um, it's said that those curving little uh, terminal buds look like um, buck hooves. So buck thorn, there you go. I use that, that little ID characteristic all year round. Um, the berries are dark, dark blue. They're real shiny. Um, and they're not exactly oppositely branched. This one gets goofy. Is it alternate? Is it opposite? It's technically called sub-opposite, as you can see in the center upper picture there. Okay. Um, in the lower right, young bark with lenticels. So when they get old, the bark is super rough. Okay, it's like real dark and it's really, really rough and peely. But when they're young, it's still smoother. Um, and you're gonna see those light colored lenticels. Lenticels is just where like oxygen is moving in and out of the bark. The leaves, when you're able to see leaves, are egg-shaped, um, finely toothed and kind of glossy. Okay, burning bush super common invasive that I find all the time um, when I'm doing site visits, especially in areas that border residential neighborhoods, because this is such a commonly planted um, decorative shrub in our yards. So how do we identify burning bush? Um, I, at this time of the year, I look for the wings. So that bottom right picture there, uh, you could see those ridges or wings that are up and down along the stems. Its other name is winged euonymus. <laughs> so there you go. Just look for the wings and that's how you know that you have burning bush. I hear from people like, oh, my burning bush is sterile. It doesn't produce berries and whatever. Usually that ends up not being the case over time, even if the horticultural industry is selling it as a sterile variety. A lot of times what happens is they revert back um, and do end up producing some kind of seed structure. And this is just very common, especially in the late fall to see this um, burning bush turning the pretty red color and you just, it's very evident throughout the woods how invasive this shrub actually is. And another one that's really commonly planted in our landscaping is European highbush cranberry. Um, yeah, this, this is all over the place. And it's a viburnum. So it's going to be oppositely branched. It gets these beautiful white flowers in the summer, these like panicles of white flowers and these clusters of red berries later on. The leaves are, are almost kind of maple looking. So this is another one to look for. And if you have these in your landscaping to consider replacing them. And I'm gonna go through some ideas for that. So how do we get rid of these things? Um, you have some, 
you have some options of how to get rid of this stuff. Um, the first method up in the upper left there is cut the tree down and then um, treat it with uh, paint on some herbicide. All right. And there's two different herbicide recommendations right there that we give. We use this, we do this year round. Um, the only time of the year when the herbicide isn't going to be quite as effective in where I am in Northern Illinois, and this applies to a lot of the Midwest and Northeast as well, is in like late February and March when the sap, if any of you make maple syrup, you'll know this, when the sap starts to move up during the day and down at night and it's the sap's kind of moving all over, um, the herbicide that you paint on the cut stump isn't quite as effective at that time. It's not being drawn down into the roots as effectively. Otherwise, year round, we're pretty much using um, and treating herbicide. And it's not being broadcast sprayed all over the place. It's being painted directly on the cut stump. Okay. Um, you, if you have really small seedlings, first year seedlings, so that means like the buckthorn dropped its little berry structures on the ground and then they grew into a tiny little seedling, you can uh, torch those with a hand torch. Now this isn't gonna necessarily work on the older guys, just on the first year guys. So you can hand pull those or you can torch them too. Uh, burning is a great tool, all right, to help control a lot of this stuff. Um, the weed wrench is another option, as you see down there in the bottom right. The weed wrench literally is like a lever that just kind of pulls the entire small, it's got to be a smaller tree or shrub to be able to pull that out of the ground. Um, there's disadvantages to this. I mean, there's people who have great success with it but it can cause a big old soil disturbance. And it can also break off, you know, fragments of root too, which can regrow. The soil disturbance, why I don't like that, um, you're gonna see when we go through the garlic mustard section, it can just encourage lots of different invasive uh, weeds to grow there, like garlic mustard. Um, cut and treat re-sprouts. So sometimes, if you don't do a thorough enough job painting the herbicide on the cut stump, um, you might get some re-sprouts. And that's, if you don't paint an herbicide on the stump, you're definitely gonna get huge amounts of re-sprouts that just kind of sprout tenfold out of the stump. Um, so you can cut those down and then you gotta dab herbicide on each little cut stem. So some tools that we commonly use our chainsaws, um, listed some of our favorite brands right there. Safety is paramount, obviously, with chainsaw use. There's a lot of land trusts that do chainsaw classes and how to use a chainsaw, ourselves included. We usually do a chainsaw class in the fall. Um, so safety equipment includes chaps. That's just those like super heavy pant coverings that you wear. Helmet, face shield, eye protection, gloves, ear protection, long sleeves, long pants, boots, the whole, whole rigmarole. So chainsaw is a really great tool. Could be a gas chainsaw, could be an electric chainsaw, depending on how far of a reach you need to be able to use. I know a lot of people that use an electric chainsaw and they're usually smaller, um, which could be easier to handle. And it's also obviously much easier to start. <laughs> which is really nice because the big gas powered chainsaws can be difficult, physically difficult to start. A brush saw, this is a great tool um, that pretty much anybody can use. So that's April there on the left. She is um, a woman of like, I don't know, she's like five foot four or something. She's about my height. And she's easily able to use that brush saw. Um, it, hangs on a harness, like a vest that goes over your shoulders. So you don't get super tired. Um, so if you don't have a ton of upper body strength, it's okay. 
basically it's like a weed whacker on steroids is what we say. So it's got that chisel tooth blade, circular blade that just can cut right through um, small to medium sized trees and shrubs. So, you know, nothing huge, just smaller stuff. Um, again, safety is really important. Um, and some of the brush saws, some of the like weed whackers that you have might have the ability to um, put an attachment on it, put a brush saw attachment on it, which is really nice. All right. And then, I mean, I use these a ton, loppers. So loppers of all different sizes. Um, to be able to take down some of the smaller stuff. Um, these are just invaluable, different kinds of loppers and gloves and a nice five gallon bucket. <laughs> it's the little things, right? So a nice five gallon bucket, be able to carry all your stuff. I'll like even stack, like when I go through and lop an area, I'll stack it all in that bucket and use it to all over to the brush pile so I'm not losing stuff. Um, and then small squeeze bottle for, for your herbicide or a dabber. So that little squeeze bottle there that you see in the picture, um, those are nice, those work, but I like this dabber situation a lot better. Um, so this is just like a piece of PVC pipe with a clamp and a sponge, like a craft sponge attached to it. That's really all this is. And I like the sponge method of applying herbicide because it's not dripping. You're not getting herbicide in areas where you don't want it to go. Um, it's very efficient and you could stand upright uh, and just dab, dab, dab on all the little cut stems within 30 minutes of cutting that tree or shrub, it's important that you get the herbicide on it. Notice that that sponge is like a weird blue color. That's because we add a blue dye to our herbicide. If you're working on your own private property, you don't need an herbicide applicator license to be able to put herbicide on a cut stump. Um, you're, you can legally buy this herbicide, Farm and Fleet, online, Ace Hardware, Menards, all kinds of places carry this stuff, okay? Um, it's important, again, safety. So long pants and gloves and boots, and uh, you don't want that herbicide to be able to come into contact with your skin at all. Okay, so when you're cutting all this stuff, you end up with a bunch of waste material and um, you need to build a brush pile. And it's important that you're not building a brush pile right under um, the low branches of a valuable tree. So like of an oak tree or a hickory tree or something like that. Uh, a lot of these brush piles can get really big and have intense fire, intense heat, and that can damage those lower branches. So look for a chimney if you're able to. Look for kind of an opening in the woods. Um, try to avoid building it on top of like really high quality plants, all right? So a bunch of those cool little wildflowers that I showed a picture of earlier. If you know that they're in that area, flag it, and then don't build a brush pile on top of those because it will sterilize the soil underneath it. Um, and if you're able to avoid building brush piles on the side of a steep slope or like a creek bank, avoid that. A lot of times the soils are thinner and more prone to erosion in those areas. Sometimes it's unavoidable, and I get that. And so you do the best you can, okay? And then finally with brush piles, people think that you have to like dump gasoline on it or something to get it started and you do not have to do that. You shouldn't do that. Um, we literally just like, we just build a tiny campfire. I mean, you just clear out a hole 
at the bottom of the brush pile where it can catch the wind, where the wind is blowing into it. And it's literally like you're building a campfire, have a bunch of little kindling there, have a bunch of newspaper or whatever, cardboard, something that's going to help you get it going. And then you sit there and you feed it and you feed it. All right. And eventually it's going to go up and you got to be patient and you're going to have to be like, pulling the branches back on top of the brush pile fire, stuff like that. Safety. Oh, a leaf blower. If you need some wind to help get it going, you can use a leaf blower for that. Um, have water nearby, wear gloves. It's good practice to kind of rake out a bare area around your brush pile so that the fire isn't accidentally spreading. Okay, so definitely being very cautious about this is good practice. Don't burn your brush pile on a super windy day, you know, things like that. All right, so then you've removed from a certain area a bunch of brush and you've burned your brush pile. And it's important to distribute some seed. Uh, seed, seed is gonna be the most economical way of getting it cover of native plants down in a large area. Um, and you can use live plugs too. And that you would obviously plant live little plants in like the spring or summer. Seed is great though. And uh, you could seed right now in January. Um, honestly, you could seed anytime, but the most effective time is gonna be in the fall or winter. Um, a lot of native plants need a like a winter kind of dormancy freeze thaw cycle to break down the coating around their their actual seed and allow them to germinate. And so if you throw your seed down like you see these girls and dog doing in the picture here, you could throw it down right on top of the snow if you want to and it's going to just work its way down. Um, the seed is dark. And so when the sun eventually shines on it, it just melts down into the snow, goes down into cracks in the soil where it freezes and thaws and freezes and thaws. And it's, it's just miraculous how it works, okay? You don't have to seed on top of snow. You could do it on top of bare soil too. Um, I like to flag, you know, flag the area so I know exactly where I'm gonna seed. If it's a large area, I will divide it into like, four or eight sections, divide my seed mix into four or eight buckets. So I'm correctly spreading that around. Um, do you have to use a filler with your seed mix? You don't have to. All a filler is, is like some kind of material. Could be like leaf shreddings, rice hulls, vermiculite, sawdust. That's just a material that the tiny seeds can bind to. So like um, when you mix the filler with your seeds, you mix them up and you put a little tiny bit of water into it and you mix them up and then the filler binds to the seeds. So then when you're throwing it, the tiny seeds have something to bind to and actually end up in the vicinity where you're throwing them. You don't have to use a filler though. So don't freak out about that. You can distribute it by hand. You don't need a tool to do it, especially if you're doing less than a couple acres or something, all right? Um, and, then, and then you wait. So you get your seed down and then you wait. And it's important to do follow-up management every single year. You never just like clear an area of buckthorn and seed it and then walk away and think you're done. Cause that's just not how it works. Birds are constantly gonna be carrying in buckthorn and honeysuckle berries and burning bush berries and blah, 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 everything else. And they're going to be um, pooping them out in these areas. So you're constantly going to, you know, need to be managing for this stuff and getting native plants, trees and shrubs in to compete is excellent, especially things that are gonna burn well, if you're able to legally burn, this is very helpful. Um, so burning is a great management tool. We do a learn to burn class in the spring. Um, managing for re-sprouts. So that picture I showed you where like the honeysuckle was just had all these tiny little 
leaf sprouting all over the place. Don't walk away from that for five years or something because it's going to eventually be um, producing seeds. That's what you don't want, right? You want to avoid invasives making seeds in your planted area. You want to get rid of that, okay? Um, learning your weeds is really important. And you just do that little by little over time. You know, your land trust, your local state park, conservation district, whoever, we're all doing these like ID classes and stuff. Go to those. Become a volunteer at, at a work day at a local area, natural area near you. That's a great way to learn how to do this kind of stuff. And every year I try to add seed and it's not seed necessarily that I always spend money on. You know, um, a lot of times it's seed that I either collect from other areas of my yard or from friends, or, you know, we do a seed sharing event for our members. So we'll share seed with each other. So I try to add seed every single year. And that just that just helps kind of close up the little gaps. I don't want a lot of bare soil for weeds to grow in. All right, so it's important that we replace that layer of buckthorn and honeysuckle and burning bush. You know, that those plants that are growing like 10 to whatever, 30 feet tall in the woods. Now we've taken, we've removed that and we need that understory layer back with our native trees and shrubs. Um, there are a lot of birds and other kinds of wildlife that like to live at that level. <laughs> and plus a lot of these things are just really beautiful to look at as well. Things like service berry. I mean, this can be informal landscaping or, and a lot of times it is, or this can be planted where it would grow <laughs> as an understory tree or shrub out in your woods, all right? So these get up to 20 feet tall. They can be multi-trunked or they can be a single trunk, just depends on how you get it from the nursery. We will be selling these in our tree and shrub sale this spring. Um, we're selling just little guys, okay? They're, they're only gonna be, I don't know, less than a foot tall or something. Um, beautiful flowers in the spring like in April or May or something, just absolutely beautiful white flowers. And then followed up with um, really cool little berry structures on them that the birds love to eat, okay? Um, something smaller is hazelnut. So this is a great replacement shrub. And okay, I'm obsessed with these. Like hazelnut in our area would have been here in Northern Illinois, would have been the most common understory shrub found in our oak savannas and even out in our prairies too. And um, they're gone now. They've basically been displaced by non-native invasive shrubs. So get let's get honeysuckle back in. We don't need burning bush <laughs> in our yards. Let's put hazelnut back in there, okay? 12 feet tall. Um, yes, you'll actually get cool little hazelnuts on there if you plant more than one so that they can kind of pollinate. They're wind pollinated. So if you can pollinate, get them to pollinate each other. So don't just plant one hazelnut, plant at least three within like, I don't know, 50 feet of each other or something. New trees and shrubs, it's important that you cage them too. So deer don't just eat them in the beginning. Go to dogwood. All right, so the service berry and the hazelnut, they're both pretty adaptable as far as soil moisture goes. Um, they're fine with like dry soil all the way to like medium wet soil even. They could do sun, they could do shade. The pagoda dogwoods are a little bit more fussy. They like shade um, or at least some shelter from like, the blazing Southwest sun in the afternoon. Like they're not gonna like that. They like it more towards the moist side. So they could do regular medium kind of loamy black top soil and wetter and richer, okay. Um, absolutely gorgeous kind of 
tiers of branches that grow and that's where the pagoda name comes from and this is a type of dogwood so just absolutely beautiful i wish i could get this one to grow successfully on my property it's too dry and sunny basically okay so garlic mustard this is a non-native invasive uh, herbaceous just plant all right that is commonly found it on the floor of oak woods, whatever, your yard, <laughs> all over the place. And if you look in the upper left there, shaped like a heart, um, scalloped edges, when you, when you pick that and you squeeze it and you smell it, it smells like garlicky onion. I mean, you could go out right now and dig down through the snow and find some of these little basil rosettes that's just like a group of leaves right on the ground that are growing pick that smell it it's going to smell like garlicky onion um these are biennials so that means the first year they're just the little basil rosettes on the ground just a group of leaves growing in the ground they don't make a flower the first year the second year they make a flower so in the upper right corner you can see that picture of the flower four little petals there. They're in the mustard family, everything in the mustard family has those four little petals. Um, and that's usually in like early May or so-ish. They start to flower like that. And then you're like, okay, it is a race against time right now. I need to get these, I need to get these out of here. So I don't want them to make seeds, right? That's your whole goal. And especially with these biennials, you don't need herbicide to control this. As long as you don't let these make seeds, um, you're going to see over a period of a couple of years, a vast improvement. And a lot of times people think they have to hand pull these out and you don't have to. If you have like a really large area of garlic mustard, where it's just like, you're like, I can't, I cannot hand pull all of that. Don't string trim it down. Don't let those flowers turn into what you see on the bottom left there. Those long spindly things, that's where the seeds are. So if you broke that open, you would see a bunch of little flat, dark seeds. You don't want those seeds to develop and uh, be dropped and spread. So in like mid-April, late April, early May, you could walk around with a string trimmer uh, or a, a lawnmower or something and just mow these down. Don't ever let them make seeds. And you'll see a big improvement over a couple of years, okay? They have a really thick taproot. There, you can hand pull them, absolutely. It's really effective when the soil is moist so that you get that entire taproot out. Um, but a lot of times there's some areas that are just too big to be able to hand pull. So just mow it. Don't ever let weeds make seeds. Oh, look at that. All right, this is everything I just talked about. So <laughs> um, if you're able to dispose of the garlic mustard in like landscape bags, you can do that, whatever. I just put it in my burn pile, like with all the brush I'm gonna burn and I burn it there and it's fine. Like that's what, that's what most places do. Um, I just throw it on the burn pile. And so like, yeah, sometimes the cut stems, they do have the capability of forming a seed. All right, even after they've been cut. So there is that possibility that's going to happen. But if you're looking at the option of doing nothing because it's too huge and overwhelming, or taking a string trimmer or a lawnmower and just mowing all of that. Yeah, there's a potential some of the mowed stuff is still going to make seeds, but the vast majority of it won't. So it's highly effective to do that. And burning, you guys, burning is great for garlic mustard control too, because the very first year little rosettes, if they're burned in the early spring, um, that'll kill them. So that's really nice. 
Okay, so some replacement, native plant replacement ideas for garlic mustard, um, things like wild ginger. So these grow in the same habitat. Wild garlic mustard likes it shady, so does wild ginger. And it's beautiful for one thing. <laughs> it's extremely beautiful, even in like really formal landscaping. It's great out in the woods too. Um, and it grows extremely densely and with really thick kind of rhizomes. So it's great at competing and out competing things like garlic mustard. If you don't get anything in there to compete, then chances are the garlic mustard is gonna come back. Things like sedges. So one example is Pennsylvania sedge. Um, that's that flowy grass looking thing. Pennsylvania sedge or oak sedge um, would have been one of the most common sedges found on the floor of our oak woods. Um, it's kind of like the backbone of the oak woods that just would have been a carpet layer all around intermingling with wildflowers and trees and shrubs. And there's whole nutrient exchange system between these native plants and fungus and the roots of our native trees like oaks. They all help each other. They're like a community of friends <laughs> that have grown together for thousands of years and they all help each other. So Pennsylvania sedge, I love this. It can grow in the sun, the shade. It could grow where it's really dry. It can grow, it just doesn't want standing water. So it's very, very adaptable. Geranium, wild geranium, columbine. These are wonderful plants to have out in your woods. Columbine will grow from seed really easily. So you can buy columbine seed. Wild geranium doesn't do so great from seed. So that's one that I would invest in some live plants. Stick them out in your woods and they fling their seeds ballistically in the spring and early summer. Um, and so they just, they just fling like really far away and that's how they spread. So you find them kind of growing throughout your woods. It's pretty awesome. Okay. What else can we do besides all of those things that I, <laughs> we just went through really quickly, become a nature ambassador, talk to your neighbors, because like I, we just talked about you could get rid of all the buckthorn and honeysuckle and whatever on your property, but if your neighbors have it, obviously it's just going to keep spreading all over the place. So talking to your neighbors, working together, helping each other do this work is hugely invaluable, okay? We have some programs to help people do this, like our conservation at home program where you can if you're putting some native plants in your yard, you're getting rid of invasives. It doesn't have to be done. Like it's never done. That's okay. As long as you're working towards it, you get a cool little yard sign, which is a great conversation starter. Um, our 5,000 acres program, if you go to 5,000acres.com, that's specifically for Oak landowners here in McHenry County, um, just like enter your, your, oak acres that you're managing, that you're taking care of, like that you're at least attempting to take care of, enter it into our database. We're trying to get to 5,000 acres of managed oak woodland in the county. And that will give you a free gift membership to the Land Conservancy, to our nonprofit. And then if you wanna have me over for a site visit, you can do that at the member rate. Conservation at Home includes a site visit as well. So that's great if you want some advice. You know, I walk around your property, help you come up with a plan, like a priority list. And then we act as a resource, you know, so you can always call me or email me afterwards. As long as you keep your membership up within our nonprofit, we will come back out and do site visits for you for free. All right, here's a bunch of resources. Where to buy seed? Uh, there we go, top three places um, that I like to buy seed from. Some great books and a bunch of other resources. Um, we run a private Facebook group called Learn, Landowner Ecology and Restoration Network. 
you just post your questions, your observations, and restoration ecologists and knowledgeable landowners, botanists from around the region will jump on and um, help answer your questions too. There's some really great things to be learned in that group. Um, all right, so with that, I am going to look and see if we have any questions. Susan wants to know, when did you say the best time of the year is to apply the herbicide on the cut stump? Basically any time other than like mid-February to March, you can apply the herbicide. The very most effective time is fall and winter um, as the herbicide is being drawn down into the roots, but we use it year round. We generally stop doing that in like end of February and March. We stop doing a lot of brush removal then, um, mainly because we're burning at that time of the year, but also because the herbicide isn't quite as effective then. All right, Philip wants to know, does the Conservancy support visiting property owners and helping identify invasive species? Yes, I just answered that. Yeah, we do. So we do site visits um, for landowners here in the county. Now, if you're in the Chicagoland region, there, that conservation at home program that was started by a different land trust called the Conservation Foundation. Um, so there are site visits being conducted in counties all around the region, okay, from southern Wisconsin all the way probably into northwest Indiana. I'm thinking there's probably a group doing it over there too. So if you need help, connecting with your local land trust to find out if they do site visits like that, just email me and I can try to put you in contact with the correct group here in the Chicagoland area. Um, if you're not in the Chicagoland area, go to findalandtrust.org and type your zip code in, okay, and find your local land trust that way. All right, Susan wants to know why do you need to burn the brush pile? Can't you just let it decompose naturally? You can, you can do that. You don't have to burn your brush pile. The thing is, depending on how much buckthorn and honeysuckle you have that you've removed, those brush piles can be seriously huge and they can end up taking up a huge amount of space. Space that you would rather have native plants growing and supporting all different kinds of insects and animals and things like that. So if it's just one small brush pile, sure, you don't have to burn it, no big deal. You can wood chip it, you know, yeah. If it has berries in it, if it's got seeds, then yeah, you're running that risk of those just kind of sitting there forever and growing. Or if you wood chip, like this is why I don't take mulch from like the free mulch pile from my township. Um, last time I was over there, I'm like, oh, look at all the honeysuckle branches with the berries all over them, ready to be all mulched up here. Like, no, I don't really want to spread that all over the place. So that's a thing that you risk doing. Um, and your whole goal is to not have those seeds on your property, okay? All right, let's look here in the chat. Somebody says, does the 13.6% trichopyr get painted on straight or should it be mixed one-to-one -one with water like the glyphosate? Good question, Carol. Um, okay, it depends on the formulation that you get. So there are products that um, if you look at the product and it says active ingredient, 13.6% triclopyr, um, generally those are going to be formulated and mixed, pre-mixed already with some kind of usually bark oil that you don't have to do anything to it. And you can just paint it directly on the stump. If you purchase a product that isn't pre-mixed, then that triclopyr, like Garlon is one of the brand names, you, you do need to mix that with something like bark oil, okay? Um, Pam says, there were two products to use to kill buckthorn, which was better. Okay, 
So yeah, I listed triclopyr and glyphosate. So I'm going to tell you, Pam, I prefer to use the, the triclopyr. Um, it's more effective on more species, basically. Um, the glyphosate, though, is cheaper and it's easier to find. And that will work with buckthorn pretty effectively. So if it's only buckthorn that you're worried about, glyphosate's pretty effective on that. Do you have to break it down then? What do you mean break it down? You just mix it. Yeah, you mix. So what I look for with glyphosate is the active ingredient will say 41% glyphosate. Okay. And it doesn't like, if you just type that in Google right now, 41% glyphosate, like you're going to, it's going to come up with a bunch of products like called like crop smart or other things. Just look for active ingredient, 41% glyphosate, and you just mix it one to one with water. Okay. So yeah, you do, you just, you don't have to mix it with some other weird product, but you do mix it with water. Okay. Good questions. Um, let me see if there's anything else in the Q&A. Mike wants to know, does service fairy and hazelnut establish from seed well at all? And how can I find out if those shrubs are appropriate in my woods? Um, so yes. Okay. Yes, they establish from seed. Hazelnut definitely is going to establish well from seed. Service fairy, definitely harder. Um, I would suggest starting with a live, like a live shrub, um, even just a little one gallon for service berry. They're a little bit more difficult from seed, but I can tell you with hazelnuts, like squirrels are taking the hazelnuts and planting them for me. And I have little tiny hazelnuts popping off. <laughs> so they're, they're pretty easily done from seed. How can you find out if those shrubs are appropriate in your woods? Good question. So there's a bunch of different ways to start learning about that. Um, so Prairie Moon Nursery, their website has a pretty good description of the growing requirements for those. One that I don't have listed on the resources is called Possibility Place Nursery. They've got good descriptions too. Um, basically, if you've got like an open sunny woods, service berry and hazelnut are gonna do fine in your woods if you're in the Midwest, generally. Um, if you really wanna dive down into it, because I don't know where you live, Mike, uh, to find out the native range of those particular shrubs, what you would do is Google um, the scientific name of hazelnut or of service berry. So you would put that Latin name in your Google search bar and then the word Bonap after that. So B-O-N-A-P. And that's going to bring you to the Bonap website and you're going to see like, oh, okay, Amelanchier labis. That's the service berry. Then you click on it and it's going to show you down to the county level a map of where it's native to. So that's really nice. Um, you can also just like email me, <laughs> email me a description of your woods or your area and let me know where you live. And I can tell you if they'll do fine in there. The hazelnuts especially are extremely adaptable and will do fine just about anywhere. All right, Jan. Is it better to have many varieties of native shrubs or better to use only a couple? For example, chokeberry, dogwood, witch hazel. I mean, diversity is great. Um, diversity is great be for a couple different reasons. So having lots of different kinds of native shrubs. And it, it all depends though on your particular site and picking you know, these shrubs that are match your, you know, like what's happening on your site. What is your soil, your moisture, your light, that kind of stuff. But diversity is good because A, you're going to support a bunch of different kinds of wildlife that way. Some things, you know, like to eat the leaves of dogwoods 
right? Some insects like to eat the leaves of dogwoods or some birds like to nest in witch hazel. And so the more kinds of life that we have, the more kinds of plants and trees and shrubs, the more kinds of life we're going to support. The other thing is if you have a diversity of native shrubs, um, let's say some random pest comes through, right? If you had all viburnums, <laughs> only viburnums planted and like there is some weird viburnum beetle go, going around right now and that beetle came through your woods it's going to wipe out all the viburnums in your woods and then you're left with a bunch of dead shrubs as opposed to if you have a diversity of shrubs growing in your woods great you only lost a few and you've still got a bunch of other kinds of shrubs growing okay they all have different kinds of root structures. They all kind of occupy a different niche as well. Some spread by, you know, rhizomes. Some have a deeper tap root. You know, they all kind of have their own little place where they do well. So I like to advocate for diversity when possible. Good question, Jan. Greg, how many years from removing four acres of buckthorn to a well-established oak forest. All right, Greg, I can tell you in my little woods in the back here where it was a very common situation. It was just me and my husband doing the work. We didn't hire anybody. You know, it was literally just us doing the work. I'd say three years, you're gonna start to see um, decent, things growing in if you follow those steps I went through and I mean it's still management like you know I'm still managing for the buckthorn and the honeysuckle and the burning bush and blah 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 and I do burn it which is super helpful but it's beautiful now and it's much less work than it was so I'd say that started happening three years into it get seed going in there right away after clearing that's vital okay to being able to do that. Jan, where can you purchase the dabber? All right, so there's a thing called a buckthorn blaster, which I think is like the store-bought version of that herbicide dabber. So if you just look up buckthorn blaster, I have personally never used like that store-bought product because what I showed you, that dabber, that's literally like a thing that we just jimmy rigged and made we are like restoration ecologist and technician. They made that out of PVC pipe and a clamp and the craft brush. Um, but if you just Google buckthorn blaster, that's like an actual product that you can buy if you don't feel like cobbling together pieces of things. All right, somebody says you don't mention poison ivy yet. Okay, so is it a plant that is over what or it is a plant that is overwhelming your woods. Can it be controlled in the same ways? Okay, I'm glad you brought this up. So poison ivy is technically a native vine. It could be a shrub sometime, sometimes. Um, I understand why uh, landowners for safety reasons want to control it. Now, if it's in an area of your woods that you're like, I don't need to access this. I don't go here. My kids don't go here. My grandkids don't go here, whatever, just leave it. It's not hurting anything. Deer actually eat the berries from poison ivy. Um, but if it is overwhelming and you're confident in your idea of poison ivy, yes, you can control it in the same ways that I just went through. But it's extremely important to know that obviously you got to wear gloves and then those gloves need to be washed in some way or disposed of. So there's, there's certain products like Technu that you can buy, Technu, T-E-C-N-U, that you can buy to wash clothes that have been exposed to poison ivy oil, um, and that'll help break that oil down. Um, you need to not burn, like burning poison ivy, large poison ivy vines that grow up trees, that can be dangerous, okay? So 
dealing with poison ivy can be can be a little bit difficult. So that's why if you're committed to doing it, cutting and dabbing is a good way to do it. Um, some people foliar spray. I don't like recommending foliar spraying. That just means spraying the leaves during the growing season with an herbicide. I don't like to recommend doing that for the most part, unless you're really knowledgeable about herbicide use. Um, the only reason I don't like recommending it is because it creates a lot of collateral damage. And there's a lot of other things that are going to be exposed to you just spraying that on leaves, okay? So it depends on your experience level with herbicide as to whether or not it's okay to use that. Um, but you definitely need to be cautious about removing poison ivy. Okay, Jan, does burning damage the shrubs? So when the shrubs are young, I'd say like less than five years old planted, then I would recommend you don't burn them. So, and all you got to do is like rake a perimeter, I don't know, like three feet or five feet or whatever, like rake a perimeter or mow a perimeter of no fuel around the shrub. All right. So then when you're burning, the burn carries through and it gets to that perimeter and there's nothing to burn. All right. So definitely um, protect your new, which is less than say five-year-old shrubs. Otherwise, if they're older and established, a lot of our native shrubs are going to do just fine with being burned. There are some that might not like it as much, um, but then they'll re-sprout and grow just fine. So all of our native trees, shrubs, plants, basically have evolved over thousands of years to actually thrive with fire, especially the ones found in our oak woods. Um, oaks and fire are, are like two peas in a pod, okay? And they just have over thousands of years with naturally set fire along with fire set by regularly by Native Americans used as a management tool. Um, they've just evolved to be very successful with fire. So, all right, good questions, guys. Philip, what is your preferred method for keeping deer from damaging newly planted trees? So I just buy caging material from, you know, Menards or whatever and just cage it. And um, yeah, that's pretty much what we do. We just cage it and I've got a ton of deer <laughs> that come through my woods. And caging stuff has been very successful, definitely. And then after, like once they're big enough to like outgrow the cage, <laughs> and I give them a lot of space, like around the actual tree or shrub, I give them a lot of space around that so the deer aren't able to just stick their nose through it. So caging is a, is a good method, okay. Okay, I think I got all, all the questions. Oh, nope. All right, Pam, I had buckthorn growing in with a lilac. I cut the entire bush down to a foot and trashed it. I then I don't, had the remaining ground down. There's no more root, but there are shreds of limbs. There were no berries. I need to sift out the shreds as best as possible and toss in the trash. Will I start to get seedlings? If no, Pam, if there were no berries, don't worry about it. It's not a huge deal. I wouldn't spend time sifting stuff. I wouldn't worry about it. If there were no berries, then it's probably not a huge deal. And if the berries, like, if they start producing tiny little seedlings, they're real easy to just pull out by hand. It's not a huge deal. I end up having to pull some out every year for my little garden beds where tree birds sit in the tree and they poop out right into the garden bed, the little seed. It's not a huge deal if you do end up with a few. Okay, so you don't need to sift anything. Okay, I think I got all the questions. Great questions, guys. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, reach out with questions. I'm gonna send this recording out sometime in the next day or so. 
and um, everybody enjoy your day. Find your local land trust. Bye.